Hi, I'm Jessica Price, and I'm an advocate for transforming our child welfare system so that it works for all families. But my particular focus is on marginalized families of color. The family separations that happened at the border in 2018 was jarring for this country. People who barely speak out in defense of immigrants were shocked and appalled at the images of children being ripped from the arms of their crying mothers and placed in literal cages. And those who worked tirelessly on behalf of this population worked overtime to try to ease the trauma that was inflicted. There is certainly a long history of family separation in the United States of America. It dates back to African Americans and slavery, Native Americans and the Trail of Tears, and Japanese Americans during internment. So this wasn't new, but there was a newness of advocacy. In 2018, I was asked to write an article talking about the similarities between what happened at the border and what happens every day at the hands of Child Protective Services. See, to the public, what happens in our foster care system is often hidden, untraceable. It's hidden behind the mandate to protect children, and it's untraceable because the conduit is implicit bias, fueled by systemic racism. Today, I want to talk about a brief history and how our policies that govern our work impact vulnerable populations. And then I'll offer strategies that we can all employ to help move our system forward. Let's start talking with the 13th Amendment. This amendment abolished slavery in the United States of America. But afterwards, African Americans still had to live under black codes, also known as black laws. Laws that really only applied to black people. It dictated where they could work, for how much, if they could vote. It also made innocuous things like pauperism, also known as homelessness, illegal. So if you were black and homeless, you were immediately apprehended and sentenced to time at a labor camp. Then came the Jim Crow era. A few years ago, I became curious about what was happening to black kids during Jim Crow, especially black kids that needed help and families who were struggling with financial need. I learned about this dual track system that started the disparate outcomes that we're experiencing today. W.E.B. Du Bois, a historian and social scientist, and his researchers decided to explore orphanages to really get an understanding of which orphanages would accept black kids and which one of them wouldn't. He split these orphanages up into three categories. One of them was called inadequate, grossly inadequate, actually. And in that one, he said, they totally focused on training black children to be servants. The second orphanage category was called a little bit more humane. In these orphanages, black children weren't completely focused on being trained for servitude, but it was about assimilation, conformity, no individualism, no religious freedom. The third category he called a loving and human home. He even wrote in his research, it didn't feel like an institution at all. Those types rarely accepted, as they called it, Negro children. I want to read to you a quote from a special committee on child welfare and race. It was written in 1930 during a White House conference. The dependent and neglected children of Negro, Puerto Rican, Mexican, and Indian families present unique problems needing special consideration. And while there is theoretical agreement among leaders in health and social welfare that the children of these groups should receive the same standards of care as other children, their needs are in reality little understood by the general public. And in many communities, they're almost completely ignored. That was in 1930. And it's pretty reminiscent of what's going on today. The needs of marginalized families of color are generally misunderstood and often ignored. That was 90 years ago. What's going to happen in the next 90 years? I'm going to work really hard so that in the next few years, that quote cannot represent our system. Now I want to take some time to talk through child welfare policy. I won't be able to do a comprehensive discussion around it, but I did want to touch on a few and how they've impacted vulnerable families. Let's think through aid to dependent children, also known as ADC, which later became AFDC. 
aid to families with dependent children. So this was created to help those families that were struggling with financial need, and it came out of the 1935 Social Security Act. But there was a lot of discretion about who got the funding. For example, there were substitute father rules, morality clauses, and you had to be a suitable home. The federal government was not very clear on what it meant to be a suitable home. So when the federal government isn't clear on that, what do you think happens? States have discretion and subjectivity about who gets help and who doesn't. Something happened in Louisiana in 1960 that was very jarring. It's called the Louisiana Incident. They deleted 23,000 children off of their welfare list, and they could no longer get services, simply because their homes weren't suitable. This wasn't the first time that it happened. It also happened the year before, in 1959, in Florida, where they deleted 14,000 kids off of their welfare list because they didn't live in suitable homes, and 90% of those kids were Black. But what did suitable really mean? Unfortunately, Unsuitable meant you were generally African-American, unwed with children. After the Louisiana incident, something happened. It spurred a lot of advocacy, and the Fleming Rule came into play. It's important to talk about the Fleming Rule because it became really the infrastructure for our system today. The Fleming Rule had two requirements. The first requirement was you can't just delete people off of your welfare list if they live in an unsuitable home. So if their home is unsuitable, you have to provide provisions and help to make it suitable. Keep in mind, they're still using the suitable word. The second rule was if the home cannot become suitable, then send the child to another home and then send money with that child. Doesn't that sound like what we do today? We remove children, place them in foster care, and then provide finances and services to the child. But now we're learning that if we want a child to be safe and feel safe, we should help his family or her family thrive. The next I want to talk about is Child Abuse Prevention and Treatment Act of 1974. We've already had ADC, AFDC, and later TANF, but they were focused on financial insecurity. CAPTA came because we needed definitions of what abuse was and what constituted a verified abuse report. We also needed ways to call in abuse reports, so hotlines were created, as well as risk assessments. But as you might imagine, now that people have a way of calling us for abuse reports, and now we have definitions of what abuse is, we received a lot of calls, and kids flooded our system. But think about this. We defined what abuse was without context or cultural information. The next legislation is the Adoption Assistance and Child Welfare Act of 1980. Because we have all of these kids now in our system, this piece of legislation required reasonable efforts to keep kids home or reunify them, also to prevent removal if we can. But it also created a Title IV-E funding stream, but Title IV-E could only be used after a child was placed in foster care. So although this piece of legislation asked for prevention services, it didn't fund it. And now let's talk about ASFA of 1997. I know a lot of people that are working to repeal this piece of legislation because it was created to respond to the high numbers of kids sitting in foster care. So it created a pathway to TPR, which is known as termination of parental rights, and incentivized adoptions. When you incentivize adoption, you decentivize reasonable efforts to reunite a family. So a lot of scholars and researchers have linked ASFA to poor outcomes with families of color. According to the National Center for Juvenile Justice, they keep a dashboard that tracks disproportionality in foster care. In 2018, every state had an issue with overrepresentation in care. But children of color are overrepresented at other parts of our system too. They're more likely to be reported to our system. They're also more likely to have placement instability. They are likelier to have an adjudication of dependent and more monitoring by us. And they also have less visitation with their biological families and they're slower to reunify. 
Last year, 61% of cases that our system verified was due to neglect. Neglect is defined as the inability to provide medical care, food, shelter, housing for their kids. Research has linked neglect with poverty, and we know that kids of color are disproportionately impoverished in our country. So when are we going to stop conflating poverty with parent pathology? What could be driving these numbers? What is influencing opinions about poor Black parents? What's bringing these kids into our system? Researchers and scholars have found that racism is contributing. Let's talk about the differing levels of racism. The first one, individual. This one we all understand. It's personal beliefs within a person. Someone may believe that if you're of a certain race, you're prettier. If you're of a certain race, you're smarter. That's their personal beliefs. The next level is interpersonal, also known as relational. For this one, that personal beliefs impacts how you interact with other people. For example, not sitting next to someone on a train because of the color of their skin. Systemic racism, also known as structural racism and sometimes called institutional. It is at the core and process that happens across systems and across society that disadvantages minority people. I know that we often say minority children, children of color, but there's another type of racism that I need to talk about. I'd be remiss not to mention anti-Black racism, which is defined as racism that's targeted to Black people. It's time for this country to acknowledge the unique positions of Black Americans, and we have to stop decontextualizing Black parenthood. I want to take some time to talk through strategies that we could employ to continue moving our system forward. We should consider community as a strategy. Child Protective Services cannot do the work of equity and well-being alone. Although we have our work to do, we still need community partners like mental health providers, guardian ad litem, the judiciary. Last year, I did a training, and at that training were child protective service workers, teachers, healthcare workers, even the chief of police. We need more of this. More professionals with the biggest hearts and the brightest minds in the same room trying to figure out how to connect meaningfully with families in crisis, but also how to maintain equity across the board. Another posture that we should all be taking is power balancing. Essentially, it means we dare to share power with the families we're serving. But how does that look? Some agencies across our country are daring to share power by participating in family group decision-making, which basically works like when you're doing a meeting at your office about a family trying to figure out what's going to happen to them, they deserve a seat at the table so their voice is heard. You're no longer talking about a family that's far removed from you and different from you and your family. You are talking to them. Research says that when parents participate in this process, outcomes are better. This further affirms that we are not the experts on these families. It's our job to partner with them and help them as they design their own lives. I can't count how many Black mothers have called me and said how they felt unheard and unseen, especially in court hearings. For the past two years, I've interviewed African-American women that have experienced our child protective services system. And I want to share with you some quotes from those interviews. Names have been changed to protect privacy. LaTanya, age 30. I was a victim of domestic violence for years. I never knew how the trauma was impacting me and my parenting. CPS said I neglected my children. They said I did not protect them. They have all been taken from me and adopted. I had to grieve my children, yet they did not die. Bridget, age 60. I've been trying to get custody of my grandchildren for years now, hearing after hearing. I've written letters and I've made hundreds of phone calls, but even still, one of them have been adopted and the other one in foster care. They've been separated from my daughter, who was their mother due to drug use, and now they're separated from each other. 
and I don't understand why I can't raise my grandchildren. Sasha, age 27. It was as if I had no room for error as a parent. Doesn't CPS realize that we are developing too? Don't they realize that we need love and understanding too? Elena, age 34. It seemed as if they had made up their mind to remove my child before they even met me. I felt completely silenced. Mary, age 49. I lost the rights to my children, and to this day, I am not clear on why. I know it had something to do with my living situation. Not enough space, I think. I wish I had paperwork or something to explain. Without courageous leadership, things like this will keep happening to parents and disproportionately impacting Black parents. Some people call it cultivating leadership fortitude. Others call it transformational leadership. But the bottom line is, you may be the leader that we need, but it depends on what type of leader. See, some leaders are driven by power, status quo, and fear. But if we're serious about creating a system that doesn't harm families, we need leaders to be brave and lead us with empathy. I met a brave leader a few years ago in Nassau County, New York. She was determined to address the disparate outcomes for Black youth in her foster care system. She started by educating her organization on implicit bias, that automatic and unconscious system that lives in all of us that impacts our decisions and our values. She created a process where your personal opinion and values could not directly impact what happened to a family. It became known as blind removal meetings, where a caseworker goes out to a home and meets the family and does a risk assessment, but then comes back to the organization to confer on what to do next. But in that meeting, demographic information is redacted. So the decision to remove a child from their family or not is made never knowing the race of the child or even where they live. This process decreased removals across the board, but notably decreased removals of black children by nearly 50%. This brought a keen awareness to this organization and sharpened their decision-making because they were focused on relevant, objective facts. It truly impacted their work. And it may or may not be the answer for you and your organization, but leadership is. We need leaders to de-emphasize punitive measures and re-emphasize protective factors. What are protective factors? They're the strong attributes that families have that help them through stressful times. For example, community involvement, social connections, consistent employment, a positive attitude. As leaders, we have to be strategic about building on those protective factors and not punishing families when they don't have them. When I think about my time on the front lines of child welfare, I wish I could go back. I wish I could change some of my decisions. If I knew what I know today, I would push back on static procedural interventions and processes. I'd work harder to understand the parents on my caseload instead of rushing, trying to meet deadlines and getting to my next case. The work was hard. And this presentation doesn't negate the difficulty of this work. But I believe that once we know better, we should do better. Now that we see what our system is doing to families, we can't unsee that. I know we can build a system that's inclusive and equitable and effective, that attracts professionals who are skilled, competent, and smart. I know we can. There's a Chinese proverb that I love, and it says, the best time to plant a tree is 20 years ago, but the next best time is now. It's not too late for child welfare. So however you decide to advocate for change, do so with a racial equity lens, and let's do it together so we can finally keep families together. <laughs>